think one of the worst characters in all of literature and cinema is Eustace Scrub. If you recognize this character, Eustace Scrub shows up in the the Chronicles of Narnia series in the book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And Eustace Scrub is the worst, y'all. He is absolutely the most sniveling, selfish boy that has ever been created in literature. How many of you are familiar with Eustace Scrub? Yeah, for those of you who are not, count yourself blessed. In the Chronicles of Narnia, we, we find the story of the, Pevens, the Pevensey kids. And they get swept up into an adventure in book two, or at least chronologically book two, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And they find out that they, get, that they are actually royalty in this incredible, fantastic land called Narnia. And they go on these grand adventures and they meet this incredible, powerful creature as a lion named Aslan. And they find out that Aslan is not just some creature, he is creator. For in the land of Narnia, he is God himself. And as the book series unfolds, one of the characters, Lucy, is so concerned about leaving Narnia because not only would she leave this fantastic land, but she would leave the presence of Aslan himself. And he shared with her the, the truth that he is not only king over the land of Narnia, he is the king over all things, but known by a different name. And we know that name, y'all. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the king. Well, in the voyage of the Don Treader, along comes Eustace Scrub. And Eustace is a cousin to the Pevenseys, and he gets swept up in the adventure, and yet he has a problem, and the problem is he cannot see what they see. He's looking through a different lens. He's, he, as they go on this journey, they're on this ship. The ship is called the Don Treader, and they're on a voyage on it. Great title of a book. The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. As they're on this ship, there's beautiful weather, and Eustace Scrub is keeping a journal, and he writes about how terrible the journey is, how terrible the storms are, when actually it's beautiful sailing. Well, if you know the story, they're on this adventure, and they come across this island. And on this island, there is a dragon's lair filled with what? Gold and treasure. And so Eustace, to to explore the island and to get out of work and responsibility that the others are doing, he comes across this treasure and he begins to take it for himself and something happens. What happens to him? He turns into something. He turns into a dragon. This is what Eustace looks like once he's turned into a dragon, at least as depicted in the cinematic retelling of the story. It's a very interesting change in imagery because the author, C.S. Lewis, he shows what Eustace has become internally, externally. A selfish, sniveling boy who cannot see what others see. And as the reader, you are waiting for something to happen to Eustace. Either get him, like Aslan, get him! He's terrible! Or change him. But as you are reading the book, this anticipation is welling up in you, the reader. What? is going to be the end of Eustace. And it's one of the tensions of the plot of, is is this boy, is there any hope for him? Because his perspective can only see what he sees, and his perspective is skewed and limited. And as the reader You're just left with anticipation and waiting. That technique of storytelling is is common. In fact, a good story 
uh, brings you into some kind of plot where you don't know how things are going to turn out. And it wells up this anticipation, this waiting. And it connects it very deeply to the human heart and the human soul. I mean, how many of you could say that life does not sound like zippity doo Zippity? Yeah, life is not rainbows and moonbeams and happy times all the time, is it? It's difficult, it's hard, and it leaves us in a tension of what is going to happen to our circumstances. So, what's true about our life is over and over and over played out in the books that we read, in the films that we watch. And it leaves us asking this question, what are, what are we looking for? What are we anticipating? Well, I think our problem is very similar to young Eustace. When our eyes have come off of true hope and what is our true north, our faith in Jesus Christ, we become overwhelmed with anxiousness, we become overwhelmed by our circumstances, we become overwhelmed with our unknowns. And we need help. And the writer of Hebrews is writing to a group of people that he's trying to gain their attention and to shift their perspective back to the unique Savior, Jesus Christ. And we have the same need to look on Him and to shift our gaze to Him and to shift our anticipation away from what will happen in our circumstances to anticipating Christ's return. I want to go through this passage with you. And we're going to do so with the very first verse of this section, chapter 9, verse 15. So turn with me in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. If you don't have a Bible, one is on the end of the row or a row next to you, and you'll find the book of Hebrews found in the, in the back half of the Bible. It's in the New Testament. It's called Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, and we're starting in verse 15. I think the wonderful thing about this passage is that the key point is in verse 15. As we go through 15 to 28 this morning, we will have the central verse in verse 15 and three supporting sections of this main idea. The main idea is that Jesus mediates the new covenant with God. Jesus mediates the new covenant with God. Now, that's a bit of a mouthful. Let's read the passage, and then we'll look at this central idea that's broken down into three phrases. Verse 15, Therefore, He is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. This section is the conclusion of the previous part of the book. If you've been around TBC for a little while, we've been talking about Jesus functioning as our our high priest, the one who before God the Father made a sacrifice of himself to redeem us, to save us, who now functions as a mediator between us and God, He prays for us. He he intercedes for us. And ultimately, He will be sent back to restore us and to bring us to Himself. He is the mediator of a new covenant, the passage says. New covenant is this idea that Jesus brought in a new way of relating to God. Before People had to go through priests for the forgiveness of their sin. They didn't have direct access to God. They had to go through somebody else, somebody else who was flawed, somebody else who had their own sin issues. And every priest had to offer sacrifices for his own sin as well as the sin of the people until Jesus came. 
Jesus had no sin. He was perfect in all of his life, yet he sacrificed himself. His death ushered in a new way to have a relationship with God. Religious systems and following do's and don'ts do not get us to God. There's not enough good effort I can do that gets me closer and closer to God. It took God coming toward us. It takes God calling us to himself in order for us to to see him and know him. Otherwise, we are like a little boy caught up in a grand adventure who cannot see what he what he perhaps could see if his eyes were opened. Jesus is this mediator of a new covenant. He is the one who has provided a new relationship, and there is an an outcome. So we have this reality. He is the mediator, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. There is, for the people of God, a great reward coming. An incredible reward. A reward with praising God about. We are forgiven of our sin. We are brought into a relationship with God that will last forever. And it is guaranteed for those who are in Christ. I believe the writer of the Hebrews is trying to get the attention of his audience and saying, when I I write to you about those who are called, I'm, I'm saying this is for you. Those who who God the Father has drawing to Himself. Jesus has done this work so that those who are being drawn to the Father through His sovereignty will receive the promised eternal inheritance, eternal life with Christ. But it took something. Something has occurred in order to guarantee these promises, and that's this third phrase. Since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Jesus is the mediator. The outcome of his mediation for us is eternal reward, eternal life with God, and it came at a cost. He had to die to redeem us, to rescue us from our sin. I'd like for you to underline or circle the word transgressions here. We have a different word than what we would normally find in the New Testament when it talks about transgressions and sin. We've already talked about in the previous uh, week about how the priests would come in and they would make uh, sacrifice, and there's a specific kind of sin that they made sacrifice for, and it was called unintentional sin. Well, this word is actually the word that is for an aggravated type of sin. This would be a word for intentional sin. So the redeeming work of Christ covers every sin is the point. Sin that we do unintentionally and sin that we have done in our brokenness and active rebellion against God. Christ's sacrifice was uniquely greater and redeemed us from all of our sin. So that's just the point. Jesus mediates the new covenant for us. Now there's going to be three sections that support this truth. And the first section is verses 16 through 18. And here's the point of this section. He had to die. In order to bring in a new way to be in relationship with God the Father, a new covenant had to be formed, and that new covenant required a death. He had to die. There was no other way for there to be a new way to enter into a new covenant with God. Look at the text. It says, For where a will is involved, the death of one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. Jesus had to die. 
Now, there is an image that's used here to get the point across, and it's about a will and testament. We know how a will works. The terms are set out ahead of time while a person is alive. And then after their death, the terms of the, the will and the testament are carried out for those that are the beneficiaries. Amy and I have a will and testament. And it's going to be awesome to see which kid gets my trumpet. I'm sure there's a raging debate in their hearts. Who gets dad's trumpet? You guys want the trumpet? Okay. It's not very clear that that's an item that's coveted um, at this time. I'll pray for the affections of their heart. We know how a will works. In order for the will to go into effect, the person has to die. What I've seen is that in the way that God has established covenants is something always had to die. When God made his original covenant with Abraham, he put Abraham to sleep and yet God sacrificed animals and then passed through the blood of the animals. He did so in an amazing way. Because what would typically happen if you and I were, in, were going to form a covenant, we would slaughter animals and both of us would walk through it. I would walk through it, I would establish the terms of the covenant, and I would walk through it. If you agreed to the terms of the covenant, you would walk through it and the covenant would be sealed by the blood. What God did is He made a covenant with Abraham and God went both directions. While Abraham was asleep, God went through one side of the covenant and he came back through the other side of the covenant. He put it on himself. When we get to the time of Moses, God established another covenant with his people, but this time it was conditional, wasn't it? It was conditioned upon their obedience to him and following the Mosaic law. But when that covenant was formed, you can read in Exodus chapter 24, that Moses sealed the covenant by making an animal sacrifice. A death had to occur in order for a new covenant to begin. Jesus had to die. He is the mediator of the new way we relate to God. And this new covenant required a death. He had to die. The next section that supports this truth that Jesus is the mediator gives an explanation of the kind of death he had to die. Let's look at this uh, truth in that it is his blood had to be shed and applied. His blood had to be shed and applied. So the kind of death Jesus had to die wasn't taking on a disease to die for us. He had to bleed. And it wasn't enough that his blood was just poured out, but his blood was actually applied as a cleansing. Look at the imagery that's found in verses 16 through 18, or I'm sorry, 19 through 22. In verse 19, it says, For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. Let me pause there. So Moses gives the term of the Old Testament law, the Ten Commandments. He gives those, he gives the other regulations that the people are to follow, and then he takes some hyssop, there's like a leafy branch, mixes it with blood and water, And he sprinkles two things with it. What does he sprinkle? First, it says he sprinkles the book. And then he sprinkles the people with bloody water. What would you do if you walked into Tomball Bible Church and I get this branch and I mix it up and I just start slinging this stuff? 
all over you. You'd go to Bayou City Fellowship is where you'd go. <laughs> It'd be okay. Here's the thing. The kind of death that Jesus died was not just to simply give his life for us, but it was to shed his blood and apply his blood for our cleansing. This is why he had to die in the way in which he died. He was crucified on a cross. He physically bled. And his blood has been sprinkled, splattered, shed for us and applied to us. This is the only way in which we can be fully cleansed before God. I cannot cleanse your sin. I'm not going to throw bloody water on you. I cannot cleanse anyone's sin. But Christ died and his blood was applied. After verse 20, I do think it's interesting that Moses sprinkled the book and because Jesus is called the Word of God, He Himself was the one who was sprinkled for us. Verse 21, or verse 20, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, He sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. There it is. Underline, circle that phrase, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jesus ushered, ushered in a new covenant with God that we would be fully forgiven of our sin. The very thing that kept us out of a relationship with God, Jesus died for. In order for that to take its full effect, he had to bleed and his blood had to be applied to us. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The implication is, is because he died. And because his blood was shed, and because his blood was applied, there stands forgiveness for anyone who believes. It's not about what we do to get to God. It is about believing and receiving what God has done for us. Jesus mediates this new covenant with God. He had to die, and his blood had to be shed and applied. Verses 9, or chapter 9, verses 23 to 28, then has this third supporting truth. And we're going to spend the majority of our time in this section of the passage this morning. Because there's going to be three appearings. This is going to be the key word through this section. The word appear. And the three appearances of Christ are going to line up with, with the most important truth that we can cling to as people of faith. So three appearings which align to three central truths for us. And this will guide what we should be looking for. We have His appearing. He is appearing. Let me say this. We will see that first. Jesus is appearing. This is about His present activity what he's doing right now. There will be the truth that Jesus has appeared. This is going to refer to what Jesus has accomplished in the past. And then because you are incredibly intelligent, if he is appearing and he has appeared, and there's a third appearance, it is because he, he will appear. This is his function as this mediator of a new covenant. Is he is appearing, has appeared, and will appear for us. Let's look at the passage. Starting in verse 23. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. 
In our previous section, we saw that, that the system that was set up in the Old Testament under Moses' instruction was that everything would be a shadow and a copy of what would be ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The Old Testament law foreshadowed the new covenant law. They were, it was a copy. Even the tent that had an outer court and an inner court was a copy foreshadowing what would ultimately be fulfilled in Christ as he passed through the heavens. So it was necessary for there to be copies to be purified. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. There's a uniquely better quality about what Jesus has finished for his people. Verse 24, For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Each of these sections, these verses, have a contrastive but in the center of them. There were copies, but these were only copies of what's better. Christ entered into a holy place, not a human-made tent or a human-made temple, but heaven itself. It says now that he, and here's our term, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. This is the, this is the first of the appearances that the writer talks about. This is present tense. This is active. This is what Jesus is doing right now. And it says that he is appearing before whom? He's appearing before God the Father on our behalf. What is Jesus doing right now? What's he doing right now for you? He's advocating for you. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, actively, presently, Jesus is making an, adv an advocacy for you. He's interceding for you. He's declaring you right before God. He's declaring that His blood has, has made payment and redemption for you. He's counteracting the voice of accusation that may be rising up to God from our enemy. It's our enemy who wants to bring condemnation. And Jesus is advocating right now. I hope that you just think about the wonderful nature of that. Ron, Jesus is advocating for you. He's saying, this one's mine. And I am enough for him. And my righteousness covers him. Hold him fast. Man, is that not good? This is the present active work of Jesus for any who are in Christ. He's saying, this is my sheep, my child, my daughter. This is his present and active work that's done in his appearing for us. I don't know if you have felt forgotten lately, but the last I checked, there is no flaw in Jesus. He does not forget us. He's actively, presently advocating for you and for me in heaven, real time. It's beautiful. He's appearing for us because He has appeared for us. Now, this goes into verse 25. Look at verse 25 with me. It says, Nor was it to offer Himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For when he would have had to suffer, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But 
as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The new covenant has ushered in a new way of relationship with God because a unique sacrifice has been completed. And the sacrifice was Jesus' own death. He's not offered over and over and over and over and given over to death. It is once for all. I love the phrase, but as it is. This is the reality of what Christ has finished. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin. This idea of put away was when after the sacrifices Uh, There was a copy of what Jesus has done, and that was when the sacrifices were made on behalf of the people. A goat was released to symbolize that the sins of the people were being sent away from the presence of God, that they're being carried off. And this is what Jesus has accomplished. He He has put it away. In these verses, we see that this has been the plan from the beginning. It's not that he should repeatedly offer himself since the foundation of time. From the foundation of time, it was determined by God that he would send his son once for all. Isn't that wonderful, y'all? Our sin does not count against us. Our sin no longer prevents us from having direct access to God. Now, what's interesting is is in over the time, uh, the course of history with the Jewish people, there began a practice of uh, what they would do with the high priest who would go into the temple to make sacrifices for the people. They would tie a rope around his ankle. Why? To pull him out in case he died. Like if he did not offer sacrifice in the right way in the presence of God, he would die for his own sin. And so there was this anticipation of the people. The high priest, he needed to come back out. Not only because for his own life, but then it would show and demonstrate to the people that that the sacrifice was received by God and that they could sustain a relationship with God because God had forgiven their sin that year. So they were always looking for the priest to come back, to come out from the curtain. Much better to have him walk out on his own accord than them to pull him out on the end of a rope. That'd be quite disturbing. So the writer of Hebrews is is using this imagery. He's engaging a primarily Jewish audience, people who have come out of a Jewish identity, who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and have become Christian and have been tempted to go back into Judaism and to practices which the Scriptures say are dead practices that do not get them any closer to God. It took God to come close to them. So we've had two appearances in this section. First, his present appearance, that he is right now, real time, appearing on behalf of the church and making advocate, <laughs> advocating for us and making intercession for us. That's what I was trying to say. His present work on our behalf is based upon his finished work when he first appeared to sacrifice himself once and for all. I think you're with me. So he is appearing for us. He has appeared for us. Thus, he will appear for us. Verse 27 and 28. The passage says, look at it with me. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, 
but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Let me read this passage again. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Here's a key truth that aligns with this verse. We have only in this life to decide whether the the claims about Jesus are true or false. Jesus claimed, there is only one way to God, and it is through faith in Him. If you're familiar with John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That is the unique claim of Scripture. The only way to God is through faith in Jesus Christ. And you only have this life to decide. Will you believe in Jesus Christ or will you deny Him? He is either God and Savior or it's a lie. When something is exclusive... It's either true or untrue. There's no middle ground when it comes to this truth about Jesus Christ. He is not a way to God. He is the only way. And this is not some claim of arrogance from a Christian pastor. This is the truth that Other forms of religion require you to to rely on your effort, to rely on how much you do, to rely on how much you give, to rely on how much effort you put forth, and it doesn't work. The only truth that has rescued me is believing what the Bible claims to be true, that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for our sins and He rose from the dead. And by believing in Him, I have been transformed. Not into perfection, but I have been made right with God. I am no longer Condemned. Jesus appeared and gave his life for me. That was his justifying work. Jesus appears for me. That is his sanctifying work. That is the work that he is accomplishing in my life by the power of the Spirit and any who is in Christ to help conform us into the image of Christ to look like Him, to act like Him, to think like Him. That is His appearing work. It is a sanctifying work, and it is based on a promise that He will appear again. And when He appears again, it is not for salvation's sake. In terms of putting away sin, because that was a finished work when He died on the cross. But when his return comes, it is his glorifying work for us. It is his rewarding work for us. It is the culmination of our salvation. And it's coming. Because he is returning. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 says this. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body, by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. The truth about Jesus Christ is when we have believed in Him as our Savior, there is a transformation that occurs. And it's kind of this unfolding transformation where we grow in our understanding of who God is. And then there will be a moment when Christ has returned, that we will be fully transformed. 
The beauty of C.S. Lewis's writing as he unfolds the tension is that there is a plan the whole time for Eustace, this sniveling, sarcastic, selfish boy. And as he'd been transformed into this dragon, there's this moment where he, becomes face, he comes face to face with the lion, Aslan, who has returned. And it is only Aslan who has the power to remove the dragon scales off of this boy. When he comes in the presence of this Christ-like lion, and he sees, he scratches in the film at his own scales, trying to get rid of the pain, trying to get rid of the suffering, trying to get rid of his condition, and he cannot do it. His claws won't penetrate the scales, and yet it is the lion. And in the film, I love how it happens. He just kind of pulls his claws through the sand. And the, his power begins to peel off the scales. And then he roars. And when he roars, it is his voice that fully cleanses and redeems the boy. And as the reader, we're like, finally, <laughs> about time. It's a temporary picture that, that aligns with a call that there is for us. The call that stands for us as the people of God based off of what Jesus has uniquely finished as the mediator of the new covenant. He had to die. He had to shed his blood and apply it to us. He had to make three appearings as our unique Savior. And the promise of his return leaves us with one central call, and that is eagerly wait for Jesus. Eagerly wait for him. This is not a passive waiting. This is a volitional, a choice to eagerly wait for the return of Christ. And so I have some questions for you. The first one is just in your own heart. Are you eager? Are you eager to see Christ appear? Is there anything that catches you up in wonder about what that moment will be like? To see him fully, fully known, fully revealed. Secondly, what scales will fall from you when he appears? What are you ready to shed? For me, there's a lot. My own flaws, my own pain in this life, the questions of my heart and my soul, all will be undone. And everything that is wrong will be made right. What will fall from you? Will it be your nagging anger? Will it be a selfishness? Will it be your lust? What, what do you look forward to that you will experience in full freedom? That it should be a motivation for us to eagerly wait for Him. And then the final question for each of us is, what must you do to deepen your eagerness? What must you do? Because the only call from this passage, in response to the truth that Jesus is the unique mediator of this new covenant, is that he's coming back. And there is to be an eagerness in the people of God that we are looking for his return hoping for his return, crying out for his return. May that be our pursuit.